I was once an iron soldier And I've been where the eagles call I will tell of a shining city And how she came to fall My name is Henry, and I'd like to welcome you to Fortress on a Hill. My co-hosts and I are a group of leftist American veterans who scour the news headlines looking for stories related to the military and veteran communities of the U.S. But you're not going to hear most of the typical military tropes here. Here we take those same stories and we clear out some of the cobwebs and bullshit. We ask hard questions of our leaders and demand an end to the militarism that has permeated our society. We have a military budget of $750 billion, three times more than China, and seven times more than Russia. While here at home, American infrastructure and domestic policy languish, especially in the era of Donald Trump. However, Big Don is only the latest in a long line of presidential warmongers and bastards. Our country has lost enough to regime change and military operations the world over, Operations that, by and large, only take innocent lives or providing no real protection from threats to our country. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Niger, and the list goes on. It's time for a change. Thank you for being with us. Tom Secker, welcome back to Fortress on a Hill. Yeah, yeah, great to be talking to you as always. So now we're going to uh, take a little while and talk about uh, War on the Fourth of July, the Oliver Stone film with uh, with Tom Cruise, and very different animal than talking about Combat Obscura, um, but mm -hmm. not 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 so different that I don't think there's a lot of a lot of good parallels there. Um, to, to discuss. Um, I'd like to start talking about the, the beginning of the movie, the, in their initial opening scenes, Ron, uh, Ron Kovic is the, is the, the fellow the uh, movie's based on, based on his book. Um, Ron is playing with some of his friends as, I, I guess they were like, what, 12 or 13, playing war, like that. War, war, war games and such. And mm. um, I, I thought that was a, a, an interesting place to start for a, a movie like this, you know, that the, the, how far back the seeds of, of being, being a hero in uniform, being a hero as a soldier or Marine really go for Ron. And, um, you know, you can see that, that determination in him as the, the beginning of the film kind of wears on, you know, he hears, he hears JFK's what you can do for your country speech on TV. And he goes and sees the, the Marine recruiter who discusses, Serving your country, very similar to that chaplain, that uh, from Combat Obscura, to saying that their lives were worth more by dying, by having been killed and served as a Marine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, the, there's really that sense of Marines are different, Marines are better, Marines are are you know the, the few and the proud. He he didn't have to say very much to get that across, but it, it, I think he did a really good job uh, getting it across and. Um, well, as far as I know, that's all very much based on real things that actually happened. I mean, the whole yes, thing is yeah. based on, on Ron Kovic's book, which is an yeah. autobiography. You know, this is pretty much the story. I mean, I think they changed a few things and compressed a bit of stuff and like they do have to for a movie. But for the most part, this is an accurate retelling of his life um, and a very faithful retelling, I think, of his life. Yeah, I, I think they uh, I think they did a good job with with getting that across in the film. I, I need to read the book. I want to actually sit down and, and read the book cover to cover. Um, it's like you said, you know, the normal, the normal things they do with, with, with making a screenplay and such. Um, but it, it's really interesting to see that arc, to see that, that beginning, you know, that beginning part of coming in and actually being, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say idolizing the Marine Corps. He wasn't idolizing the Marine Corps, but, uh, 
he was feeling really... inspired in that way. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my words aren't flowing very good at the moment. Um, <laughs> That's right. um but but the uh, just just the steps that they they take and how that fits in there. Um, how, uh, um, well, anyway. So um, I thought it was very relatable as well. That's one of the things I like about that opening is that. I mean, you know, we're all guys. I'm sure when we were that age, we all played some kind of war game, cops mm-hmm. and robbers, cowboys and Indians, whatever it was. Yeah. We've all played that sort of game at some point in our life, even if it's just with water pistols or something, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so, you know, it's very relatable for the audience. They can all see a little bit of themselves in this protagonist. And that, given the extremes, I guess, that the protagonist goes through, he goes through some pretty big character arcs throughout the course of the sort of i don't know 20 years or so that the film covers um a bit less than that but whatever uh but to make all of that relatable and to set us up to understand this kid and and the young man and the ultimately adult that he grows into i thought that was very effective because that you have to do that otherwise you might end up being somewhat alienated by this character and the rather extremes of emotion that he goes through if they're not relatable, the film doesn't work. I guess no. is what I'm saying, and that opening very much helps hook you in to this guy. Um, yeah, it does. It Especially does. at the time, you know, in which the movie came out, you know, I, and the audience that they were uh, showing it to, you know, like you, you think a lot of guys, you know, it's like, oh, this, this is a war movie, you know, so who's going to be watching it? A bunch of dudes. So when you, yeah. when you're uh, showcasing it to that and then everyone you have that really relatable story of being a kid growing up and then you get to his high school and like the way that he you know his typical like middle class suburban lifestyle a lot of people are like yeah that's totally me I can totally relate to that mm-hmm. another thing I really liked um, about the certainly like the opening act of the movie if you like uh, is the wrestling scene you know, he's a, yeah. he's a wrestler in high school. And in almost every war movie that you would see, you see that is certainly the DOD sponsored ones, that protagonist would win that wrestling match. It's, <laughs> right. pre, it, it's prefiguring the rest of the narrative whereby he goes to war and is victorious, right? That's what that whole scene is about. It's a bit of prefiguring for the rest of the story. But because the rest of the story is actually kind of quite grim, and this guy ultimately ends up turning against the military and completely turning against the war, the fact that he loses that wrestling match, again, sets up the rest of the movie perfectly. And it's a little early sign that, you know, this isn't going to be a conventional war movie. This isn't going to be a happy war movie with a nice resolution, that there is going to be stuff in this that is disturbing and people are going to fail and things are going to go wrong. And that's, yeah, great bit of storytelling, great bit of filmmaking. I thought it was interesting that they, I mean, I know it's based on his book, but again, like wrestling is a very individual sport and his story is very much about, you know, his own personal journey. And a lot of, um, I think a lot of, you know, pro military movies would have shown a team sport, you know, very much of like, Oh, look at what we did together, blah, blah, blah. And like, whereas wrestling, it's you and the other dude on the mat and, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And that's, you know, they wanted to show that nuance to be like, it's not, you're not always going to win. Life isn't always like a happy story. Mm. And there was that, uh, that was one of the sticky notes that was in your, uh, in your files, Tom, that mentioned that the, that whoever, whoever was reviewing it when they did the initial review, that they made a note about that he should have won that match as far as they were concerned that the DOD would have wanted that change to be made. And so you can really see them pushing, pushing up what you're talking about here, Tom, that they, they are are already setting us up for a letdown, but, but they're, but they're breaking the, the war, the war movie rules a little bit to do that, which is, I, I think was a, was a great choice on their part. And again, like you said, it's, it's biographical, you know, Ron, Ron would not want it to be, different from how what what actually happened with him because that is what what set him up there yeah yeah and and it also it makes you again i think it makes the character more relatable and also more likable the fact that he fails in the wrestling match or at least he loses right. i mean you can argue whether that's a failure but you know what i mean um that he's not 
being presented as this oh he's just a sort of natural born winner yeah. he, he is the best of the best and that's the end of the story and that's all there is to it it's like no life is much more complex than that and people are much more complex than that and this movie is a complicated movie emotionally speaking he goes through a lot of different places in order to end up where he ends up um it's not a straightforward comfortable narrative at all so i like the way they subverted that rather classic war movie trope of you know he was he was the captain of the football team or whatever um they kind of threw all that out the window and said no no that's not how life really is let's make a movie about how life really is for these people and and that's what they did so So I wanted to talk a little bit about the the actual combat scenes in the movie, and I I really liked that they were kept to a to a minimum. You know, it was it was a, a pretty short portion of the movie. I'd say it was under twenty minutes, probably. Yeah. Um, and that also is that they didn't show anything from Ron's first tour in Vietnam. He served two tours, and when you see him, he's already on his second tour. Mm. Um which I thought was an int a, a interesting way to look at some, because, you know, the, the, you would think that you would show a little bit from the first tour and kind of give a, give an idea of what he went through. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be very long, but by, you know, that nothing, Ron, Ron didn't specifically notice anything powerful until this moment. And that means that that much of the war had already passed by him and mm. he he had been successful in it. He seemed like he was a, a a good leader, strong in what he does. Um, but and and the, the reason I bring it up is it it reminds me of of us losing guys that have been uh, you know on their ninth, tenth, eleventh deployment now in the war on terror, and that sometimes the damage doesn't come till later. You know, sometimes somebody can make it through nine deployments didn't get any major injuries, were never wounded, you know, n nothing significant happens. And then that ninth one, they lose a leg or, or is something in that way. And so I, I um, you know, you, you, Tom, you and I were talking with Combat Obscura about the, the mundaneness of being in the military. And it's possible that Ron's first tour could have been that. It's just, it was, it was boring. We didn't see much action. There wasn't anything noteworthy about it. But I think that that was a, uh, it's it's an interesting story story bump to go over. Sure, sure. It's an interesting it's, it's an interesting omission because, like you say, in a normal war movie, that's not what they do. No, they'd show you some of the first tour, and then you know he comes home, and you'd see a bit of that, and then you'd see him going out for the second tour, and maybe you'd get a, a bad omen or two or something like that. No, no, they just cut straight to this is the story we want to tell. This is the moment of significance in his life where everything changed. So let's get to that almost as, as quickly as we can, because what we actually want to show are the consequences of that unfolding over several years. That's the bulk of the movie. That's the body of the movie and the story they wanted to tell. So rather than, I don't want to say waste time, because it's not necessarily wasted time, but yeah. In quite a long movie to begin with, if they'd added in another 20 minutes of his first tour that isn't particularly interesting, it just kind of sucks all the momentum out of the story in the movie. So they thought, just leave that out. Doesn't it, It's not important to the story we want to tell. So an interesting creative choice and one I think works very, very well. Also, I think there's like a level of understanding about those, you know, you're, you have a sense of who your audience is again. You know, the people that are watching this, they understand you know, okay, this is what a war movie is going to be. And they're saying, no, like, we don't want to just show the action and the fight scenes and the explosions. We want to show you what happens to those people after the explosions are done. So mm -hmm. there, there's this expectation of <clears throat> that's what the audience, like the audience is expecting, oh, this is what we're going to see. And like, yes, we kind of know what, like they might make some assumptions about what's going to happen. And then that's not what the movie's about. So, yeah, I really like that. I, like you said, it's just like, oh, wow, we're going to subvert some of these tropes a little bit and give you something unexpected. I liked uh, during during the scene where he, when he accidentally shoots his, his platoon leader, I liked the use of the beach and the sunlight as kind of a, a fog of war moment. You know, as I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how much of that scene actually measures up to Ron's story, but the, 
that they were willing to, you know, to to really show all the stages of emotion for Ron from coming from the coming from the houses where the kid where the kids and the family had been murdered, then coming back, he's really irate. He's trying to get himself under control. He sees what he thinks is an enemy. He goes to fire because he's you know it's right at that cusp. Um, mm-hmm. I really I really like the use of the beach and the the sunlight in that way to you know because almost you know I I just wrote down on my notes this fog of war because things just ordinary human things can mean that you don't you don't see what the full picture you don't see what's actually happening and um, I liked the their use of that for the audience. Sure, and and the fact that the guy he ends up accidentally well deliberately shooting but because he thinks he's someone else yeah um yeah. that the guy is in shadow you know he's backlit all we can see is a silhouette with a gun yeah so we don't realize who it is he's shot until he does it's not like we see this coming no We're very no, much no. in this in the moment with him so we yeah. can understand how he ended up doing that even though he didn't mean to so again makes the central character much more sympathetic and much more relatable and that's like, so important in a film like this because if he's not that, the whole film fails. What did uh, what did you guys think about his commander refusing to acknowledge what he did when he af- after he had found figured out that it was his his platoon leader that he shot, and he went and tells the commander what he did and tries to tries to get the reaction he's after, and he doesn't get it. <laughs> Because he wants to be in trouble, he very much yeah. want you know his, his consciousness is saying this is wrong, this is fucking horrible, and here is my superior standing next to me telling me, uh, no, 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 I, I don't think that's what happened, Ron. I don't, I don't think that because he he doesn't even even meet him halfway and agree that this thing actually happened, but they they have to deal with it in a different way. He just completely disavows that it could possibly have happened at all. Right, and it's it's probably because so many of the, um, I mean, we saw this so much in our time, and you know, it's uh, when something happens that maybe doesn't make the military look in the best light or that specific commander, they may not want to tell that story because they're going to have to deal with a big headache anyways, because it's it's, they'll it'll be seen as a failure of leadership on their part. So a lot of them would just rather sweep it under the rug, pretend like it never happened. You know, Oh, he got shot by an enemy and that's that. So it, like, that's the way I always think about it. When I see that kind of stuff in movies, it's like, well, they just didn't want to deal with the consequences. Mm. And I think the, the, it's a recurring theme in the whole film is the military not yeah. wanting to, as an institution, I mean, not wanting to deal with the consequences of their own actions and decisions. Um, I mean, from the point of view of the the entertainment liaison offices, there's a couple of things here. The first is that when this film was originally in development in the late 70s, this was one of the things that the DOD didn't like, that when the film was first being trying to be made, they went to the DOD and asked for some help. And this was one of the script elements they basically said, we really want you to change. We don't like this scene of the superior officer, the senior guy saying, no, no, let's just cover this up and pretend it didn't happen that way. And I can see why, from their perspective, that they don't like that. But as as you guys are saying, surely this happens not all the time, of course, but you can see how this actually probably happens fairly regularly, that when fucked up things happen and people make horrible mistakes, they don't want to fill in the report saying a horrible mistake was made. Um, It's much easier and more convenient for everyone except for the poor sod who's fired the gun um, it's easier for everyone else to just pretend that isn't what happened. So I can see how it happens, how this scenario plays out. Um, but it's quite a it's quite a powerful moment because it kind of helps set up what comes afterwards. That he's the Tom Cruise character is, is carrying this guilt with him, mm-hmm. and that it's never really resolved until right right at the end of the film um, when he, he finally manages to sort of a- admit this and actually. You know, he, he goes and, and visits the guy's family and tells them everything. Um, that without that sense of guilt, we don't think this necessarily think this guy has got much of a conscience. 
Whereas the whole point is he does have a conscience. He is actually a, a good person, a decent person at heart. He may have, you could argue, made the wrong decisions, but he didn't make them out of some sense of wanting power or wanting to be a sort of bad person. He, he made them out of sort of good intentions. Um, and it's in so many ways a story about how good intentions can go horribly, horribly wrong. Um, and again, it, it makes you like the guy. It makes you respect him and kind of want to see him succeed. And so it makes it so much more painful to see him struggling so much in the second two acts of the movie after he gets paralyzed. It makes all that kind of heartbreaking. I mean, there are some really, really heartbreaking moments in this film. And it's necessary in order to tell the story that they're telling. But it certainly, certainly isn't a particularly happy movie. Um, no, no. But, but they don't kid you on that. It's not like they set you up to think it's going to be a happy movie. They kind of tell you from the off, something's, it's not going to go that well. It, this is going to be a hard look at real life rather than a sanitized view of the heroism of war, as so many films are. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up is there's a very, very similar scene in the unmade film Fields of Fire, which is also about the Vietnam War and is also based on a book written by a guy who was actually there. Uh, James Webb, the guy who actually became Secretary of the Navy for a short while. Um, very, very similar scene in that, and a very, very similar response from the senior officer. So I think this is something that it seems probably happened fairly often in Vietnam and was swept under the rug as a matter of course, just by habit. That's what they did, because it's, it's come up in a couple of movies. And of course, Fields of Fire was never made because the DOD wouldn't support it, precisely because it contained scenes like this. So <laughs> it tells you quite it tells you quite a lot about the, the DOD's priorities and PR objectives and so on. Um, and, and hence, very brave decision for the screenwriters Oliver Stone and Ron Kovic himself, uh, who who wrote this screenplay, to say, no, we're not going to shy away from that. Why should we shy away from that? This is something that people aren't getting to see and need to see. They need to understand this is what it's really like. So. They did that. And it, and it kind of paid off. I mean, you know, some of the people who reviewed the movie and saw the movie didn't like it and, you know, complained and bitched about it. But most people thought this is actually a bloody good film. It won Academy Awards. It was very commercially successful. It was quite widely praised by critics. So I think they took a brave decision and it, it paid off for them. And they deserve quite a lot of credit for that. Tom, do you think the delay in filming from, what was it, late 78 to 88, 89, paid a, uh, played a role in that? Yeah, in some ways, because one of the reasons why the project fell apart in the late 70s is that that was when Hollywood started making more critical Vietnam War films on a fairly regular basis. You had films like Coming Home and Apocalypse Now, and it seems that the filmmakers looked at those and thought, we don't want to compete directly with them. And so the project got shelved for a while. And I think it meant that because they came back to it some years later, I mean, essentially what happened was that Oliver Stone, who'd written the original screenplay, but was, wasn't slated to direct. Um, and then this is back when the central character was going to be played by Al Pacino, which would have been interesting. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, he, he said to Ron Kovic, if my career takes off and if I'm in a position to make this film in several years time, um, and if I have that kind of authority, we will come back to this and we will make this movie. And then after the success of Platoon and Wall Street, obviously at that point, Oliver Stone could almost write his own ticket. And he said, yeah, this is the movie I want to make. So he went back to Ron Kovic and they said, let's, you know, redress the screenplay a little bit and let's make this movie. And I think an extra 10 years of time, the, um, I guess the recognition that Vietnam was a horrible war was a lot more of a kind of raw thing to put in a film in the late 70s with another 10 years benefit. Quite a lot of people had started coming around to that view anyway. And I think that's one of the reasons it kind of went down quite well with audiences and critics is they were better prepared for a film like this. They were more accepting of a film like this. So the filmmakers could be that bit braver and that bit more controversial in what they decided to include and focus on. Um, so yeah, I do think that that 10 year gap 
in some ways probably really, really helped the movie. Another little interesting thing is that in the original screenplay, um, there's an extended sequence when Ron is going through training. He's going through Marine Corps training at Paris Island, um, much like in Full Metal Jacket. And the DOD had problems with this, se with this sequence, especially one scene where the, uh, some instructors are like punching him in the gut, trying to toughen him up, you know, trying to get him to whatever, awaken his inner animal and all of that kind of thing. And they said, oh, no, no, we really, we don't like the punching scene. You've got to take out the punches. And they did in order to get access to the real Paris Island and film there, which was what the agreement was going to be. They, they took that, that scene out. And I think when they came back to it 10 years later, one of the reasons why they didn't include the training sequence is because they decided we can either make this with DOD support and go to a real training facility and make that sequence very authentic or we can leave it out and have freedom to write the rest of the screenplay as we want to, knowing that if they did go to the DOD, they'd have to cut out half of the best bits of the movie. So I think that's one of the reasons why there is no training sequence, why we don't really get to see, we sort of see Ron being recruited and then it almost cuts direct to the combat scene. Um, why there is no in-between section is because they decided to leave that out so that they didn't have to deal with the DOD and their censorious policies. Um, and again, makes for a better movie, much better movie. Absolutely. I, I, I commend them for, for doing that. And especially after seeing the notes that DOD left them, I, I would want to do the same thing. So kudos that they were able to make it in such an authentic way without having to include DOD. Cause you know, if we think about more modern films, you know, Black Hawk Down could not be portrayed very well if it without the assistance of the DOD. You just you, it wouldn't it wouldn't have made the same film. Um, no. But thankfully here that that's not what they were after. So and and we got a much better portrayal because of it. guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us. But we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with someone. Anyone who you think might be affected by it. Maybe a, a young person looking to join the military or parents advocating for one. Uh, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name. Advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment that the military creates for minorities and inflicts on them around the globe. And anyone else you think it might affect, please take a moment and share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're very blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I probably can't think of right now. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are Matthew Ho. Will Arends, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James Higgins, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, and Matt the Virgin Slayer. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if you'd like to contribute and Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or check out our store on Spreadshirt. The great Bill Kropinski did a really awesome job making our first shirt, which you can find at shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Make sure you check on the site there for promo codes before you order. And now, let's get back to the podcast.
Um, the conditions in the VA hospital, or I, I don't know that he was in a VA hospital specifically. I know some of it was, was when he was in a hospital still back uh, overseas. But mm. the just the just the malaise of it, just the, the, the nastiness and the, and the pain. And um, it was hard to watch. It was really hard to watch. I mean, I've had my own experiences with being in a hospital as a, as a veteran. Um, but, you know, the, just the hopelessness. And I, I think it was really, probably really hard on Ron, but really brave on his part to even include that in the story. You know, that mm -hmm. the, 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 the disgust and the the not knowing if you're going to get care and um thanking thanking my lucky stars that the va is much much better now than it was back then <laughs> oh sure um well and the suffering of the people around him i mean that's the thing yes. it's not just sort of ron's experience himself it's that he's surrounded by other guys going through more or less the same kind of thing um there's but there's very little uh, that's uplifting. There's very little in that whole experience that he can kind of hang on to that you can see, oh, well, at least the guy next to me isn't so badly off. It's like the guy next yeah. to you is in the exact same boat. He's just as depressed and miserable as you are. Yeah. Um, and again, this was something in the original script the DOD didn't like. They said, you know, the, the, the squalid conditions and the kind of abusive staff and the incompetence of the whole, you know, VA experience in the hospital. Uh, they said, we, we, we don't like this. And yet, it's all true. Um, exactly. <laughs> um, it's yet another one of those examples of the DOD just not wanting to stare down the barrel of truth about itself um, and wanting to kind of avoid that and wanting audiences to avoid that. And once more, the, the, the filmmakers took a very brave decision and Ron himself took a very brave decision because people, you know how it is when you go to the doctor, you don't generally don't want to tell people about the fact that you've even been to the doctor let alone tell them what it's about and, yeah. and all of that kind of stuff most people that are very private about that kind of thing let alone being stuck in a hospital paralyzed miserable for months on end that's not a story most people would have the guts to talk about um and i understand why i'm not criticizing people for that but I, I'm, I'm just praising ron ron kovic for kind of having having the guts to say, no, no, this is a vital part of the story. This is a vital part of the experience that I went through, and therefore it has to be in this movie. Yeah, because you're seeing his whole transformation from his image of himself as this, you know, Marine, like, you know, badass dude, to, like, now he's stuck in this bed, and he can't, you know, do anything himself. And he has to deal with the mental, like, challenges that go along with that and i feel like you know for for a movie i feel like they did a really good job of of that like you you start to feel that you know squalid sense of hopelessness of just like oh crap like he can't do anything for himself anymore and and yeah just having to sit in his and like have nothing really to interact with but his own head and like the people around him that are dealing with the exact same thing No, it, it's, uh, I, yeah, I, I agree with you, Tom. It's just, it just, it, it, the, the courageousness of it is, is it's, it's hard to find, you know, that, that most people, most people cling too tightly to the notion of hero in their own story mm -hmm. to be willing to step back far enough and, and, and let those kind of things out. And, and, um, well, and let's face it, men aren't good at admitting weakness, just no. in general. I mean, some, yeah. some, men, are, some men are, but, you know, mo most of us just aren't. <laughs> so to be able to admit not just the, the sort of the physical weakness and, and you know, the, the kind of desolation of being paralyzed, but also the, the mental and emotional struggle that he went through, that's something most men just wouldn't. You know, something you might tell your wife or something, you know, but you wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't go out in public and start talking about no, it. No, no. Um, well, and he doesn't have any, he, he never had, you know, a frame of reference to how to even start to deal with that, right? Because, like, men of, and generally in men, but like, especially men of his generation, you know, it's like, you have to be the provider, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And like, when you can't do those things, what do you do? There's no coping mechanism that he ever learned. He just had to figure it out on his own. 
Mm. And I suppose, I mean, that's, it's not a happy ending as such, but at least we get to see that, that the guy does in time manage to figure out a lot of this and manages to figure out yeah. a way of being without, you know, having to cling to the, the man he was before. Um, and that's, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be fascinated to read the book because it's probably even more moving than the film is. But again, a lot of praise for this guy for, for being able to do that because I think a lot of people understandably wouldn't. Um, and therefore, it's it's not that the, I guess, you shouldn't tell a story about someone struggling and not being able to eventually overcome these things, but it's a better story that he does eventually overcome them. Um, and And I guess a story that aside from in a handful of, of movies and popular books, most people have just never heard. Um, yep. a, a lot of these, you know, particularly in the Vietnam era, a lot of these guys were just kind of swept away and ignored by the press. And, you know, they never really got to talk about this stuff. So, you know, no wonder so many of them went on to suffer from very serious mental illness. And sadly, so many of them ended up committing suicide. It's like, well, where else yeah. could they go? There wasn't, like you say, there wasn't another... There wasn't a framework for him. There wasn't someone standing there telling him, I went through this 10 years ago and this is how you'll get through it. It's just kind of left to ultimately figure it out for himself. Um, and that's tough. You know, that's, I mean, we all go through stuff like that in life and it is really tough, um, but makes, makes for all the better and, and an import, more, all the more important a story to tell is, the, I guess, the point I'm making. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you guys about the family roundtable that they had when, when Ron first gets home after he's, he's, he's been injured and, you know, he gets home and everybody kind of fawns over him in their different ways, depending on if it's mom or dad or brothers and mm -hmm. sisters. And he has a, a very large family. Um, and something I thought was another brave addition was, him being forced to sit at that table and see now that there is a dozen different opinions on him, the war, why he got injured, you know, everybody has, has moved off to their, their specific soapbox. And Ron now has to deal with that. He has to deal with this, this wide variety of people, you know, seeing him in different ways. And it was the same with um, when he went to go tell the Lieutenant's family that he was responsible for his death that, you know, that, that mom had her own reaction and dad had a similar, but different reaction. And I want to say it was younger sister, um, or, uh, it was, you know, was really upset. I, I, we, we don't talk very often about how polarizing war is and how just the discussion of it, and especially the closer it gets to us, if we have relatives or friends that have served or have actually served ourselves. Um, I thought that was a, I thought that was a neat, a neat addition. It certainly is because it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that, I mean, whether it's war or whether it's something else that's quite polarizing, obviously these days, almost everything in oh, politics sure. is deep, deeply polarizing, but certainly <laughs> war has been for quite a long time and vietnam especially so um and yeah that shift in atmosphere from the you know the, the cheerleaders and the parades and everything that that we see at the opening of the film and it's sort of the early period of the vietnam war where it's all you know we're going to go in there and we're going to win and we're going to be victorious and then a few after a few years people started to realize maybe we're not maybe this is just going to be a grinding war that accomplishes nothing except killing and injuring and causing suffering um and that cultural shift i think i'm not exactly sure when it took place i'm no sort of expert in the history of the vietnam war and everything but the way it's portrayed in the film is that you know he's coming back to a very different world to the one he left that he isn't just having to deal with what's happened to him He's having to deal with the fact that his family is somewhat different. His hometown is somewhat different. The people around him that he knew and that he thought saw him in a certain way, some of them don't see him like that anymore. And, you know, there's that, that bit when he first gets home and everyone's sort of crowding around and saying, oh, you look so great. You look, you know, you look really good. And you kind of get this feeling that they're being a little bit condescending. Yeah. And it's like, 
you know, he's in a wheelchair. He doesn't, he doesn't look that great, to be honest. He, he doesn't, you know, he, he's alive and sort of halfway healthy, but he's not looking his best for certain. Um, and then that, you know, fades away very quickly. And he realizes there's now a kind of dark underbelly to his whole home life and his hometown situation that wasn't there before and that he now has that to deal with on top of everything else. And um, I mean, Abby Hoffman was a consultant on this film. Do you know about that? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. On the whole sort of, you know, the anti-war aspect of the movie that very much dominates the final act, the final third of the film. Um, and I think it's partly the influence of that, that they had to, again, set up what was coming in the later part of the movie that, you know, they've got to plant a few seeds there, that there is now significant dissent towards the Vietnam War, which there wasn't when he left. No. Um, that the America he thought he was coming home to isn't the America that he's actually coming home to. Um, and that's very powerful stuff because it's an experience tons and tons of Vietnam veterans had. Tons of people came home and found themselves in that situation. And it's a very difficult situation to deal with. Um, again, makes the, makes the protagonists so sympathetic and makes his journey so much more understandable and relatable. Well, I think that's what's so interesting, you know, is that he is defending like the actions of the government in the beginning. You know, he's very like, anti. he's like, why are these protesters? But like, he's getting angry at them. And it, because there's so much of that identity that he wants to hold on to, right? It's about, you know, I'm still a Marine and I can still do X, Y, and Z. But like, he doesn't want to accept the fact that maybe he can't do those things. And like, his reality is different, you know, and it's, I just thought that was such a cool thing to show as well. It's not like he comes home and all of a sudden he's anti-war. It's like there's there's a lot of his own personal identity and pride wrapped up in everything and his own shame and guilt of what happened to him. So it's just so funny because he there's a lot of us, I think, that when we come out of, it may not be like as visceral as we're against the people that are protesting, but there is certainly a sense for those of us that come out of the military when we're talking to people that have not been in the military and especially younger kids, you know, and it's like, what are you like, what are you saying? Like, you, it's hard to empathize sometimes because you're like, you're, you have no experience with this, you know? Yeah. And that's, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very common thing for a lot of veterans, I think. And they, they did a good job of, of just explaining, expressing that. Well, and another thing that I really enjoyed about that is is the fact that it's a member of his own family who first confronts him with this. It's not some right. you know ran random protester on the street or something. It's you know it's in his own home. He can't avoid it. He mm -hmm. can't shut himself off from it. But also, so much of that anti-war sentiment, um, and this was especially the case with Vietnam, but frankly, it's still fairly true now. A lot of that anti-war sentiment is misdirected. It's let's get angry at this soldier or Marine in front of it. Right. It's not let's get angry at the politicians who started this war or the DOD who managed it. It's let's get angry at this particular guy. And this guy, the guy's in a damn wheelchair. It's like he's, exactly. suffered, he's suffered enough. He doesn't, he doesn't need protesters throwing this shit in his face. Um, so, and, and obviously, you know, you, we all remember or at least know of the stories about you know, parades for returning Vietnam veterans and there were anti-war people spitting on them and throwing stuff at them. And it's like, you're, you're directing it at the wrong people. It's right. not, you know, it's not them that you're really angry at. It's not what they did that you're really angry at. Um, it was decisions that happened way above their, you know, responsibility and pay grade. So getting angry at the poor sod on the ground who actually spent, you know, months wandering around some Vietnamese jungle getting bitten by mosquitoes and being sold heroin and all the rest of it. It's just the wrong person. You don't get angry at them because it doesn't accomplish very much. And it just generates further hostility and division and alienates people from one another. And I mean, this is exactly what you're talking about, right? Especially with kids is that they think, oh, the person I need to be angry at is that person who was in a uniform um, because that's the person I've got access to. That's the outlet I have for directing my frustration and sadness about this war. But that's not where people should be directing it. Um, it really isn't. 
and his 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 contact with his family getting home you know that that may have been his mother's first uh time dealing with somebody in in a condition like ron was but yet like you you mentioned that it's the easy target you know we're trying to figure out everybody wants something to blame for whatever it is that ails them in in family here comes ron home and he was supposed to bring us honor and glory and whatever other words you want to throw in there as far as being a marine and now he's in a wheelchair and is a is a disabled eyesore so to speak um they even uh, there was even a, a post-it note i noticed from the dod about that scene where the guy just wrote love it or leave it um and i i, I think he gets right to that that really visceral thing of of we're, we're you know right on the spot what whatever connection we happen to have you're the easy target let's let's just throw it throw it at the uh, at the guy already in the chair and like you said he's the fucker's already suffered enough mm-hmm. well and the, another thing that I, I actually one of the interesting things in the dod file is their um not just their comments on the script in terms of what they wanted changed but just their summary of the story and they hit upon in some ways, the essence of this middle, this second act of the movie is that he returns home to a bunch of people who've kind of, you know, mostly done quite well out of this war. A lot of them are, are rich or at least you know, reasonably successful in their lives. And that Ron is a reminder to them of the immorality of the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And that's what they resent in him is that he's wheeling himself about reminding them day after day that actually, no, this war was kind of horrible and that there's a lot of suffering got caused here. And they don't want to be confronted with that brutal reality. They want to, if you like, maintain the myth of the good war, that the Vietnam, that Vietnam was a good war. And so this, this daily reminder that all of that stuff they took for granted is actually not true. That's ultimately what they're reacting against. They're not reacting against him personally. Most of these no. people have no resentment towards him as a person. It's, it's what he symbolizes, what he represents for them in terms of disrupting and subverting their assumptions about the world they live in, about America's mission in the world and, and all of that. And I thought, you know, these, these people at the DOD Entertainment Liaison Offices aren't stupid. They understood what the movie was saying and what it was doing. Um, they're just kind of, <laughs> they didn't like it, so they tried yeah, to censor yeah. it. Um, yeah. No, the, the, the post-it notes reminded me of, of somebody, you know, an asshole writing in your high school yearbook, not so much somebody from the military actually making notes about this reality of a, of a paraplegic veteran. You know, he's, hmm. he's, he's beating his head against the desk so hard over, you know, the normal things, like I was talking about that Ron losing his match is something that they didn't care for, that they wanted him to win, that it we're all winners and you know the, the it's never uh any hatred that he has is not specific towards the service it it's past that you know that they they seem like they were okay for him to go past the marine corps but if he was angry at all at the marine corps that was something they were going to take issue with yeah yeah very much so no no totally when you look at these uh, post it notes on the draft pages of the script it's almost like the guys trolling the script writers yeah it's almost like he's sort of <laughs> finding something to kind of sarcastically put down in this script and just to sort of try and be sort of kind of a kind of an asshole really yeah and it's no, like it... you do realize this is based on a real guy's real life that this isn't something that oliver stone dreamt up because he's some lefty whatever this is based on a real story most of this actually happened the way it's depicted and they're like oh no 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 we don't we don't care for that well it really happened so through you yep too bad for them I, uh, and also the shit they gave him about, uh, playing baseball in his wheelchair. I thought that was really, really low and cold of them to, you know, the, it, it's all, all the notes said, I think it was baseball in a wheelchair, question mark, exclamation point. Yeah. And again, it, it, you know, like you said, they're not, they're not stupid. They understand what it is. So why be so deliberately cruel? You know, I mean, and and, mm. and, may, and maybe that's just another layer that they use to keep that distance from them. You know, sometimes you see people that are just 
exceptionally cruel, but they use it as a it's a wedge. It's a way to keep people away, to keep the this more serious things away. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, these comments are pretty heartless. And that one especially, because uh, like we were saying before we were recording, this is a guy who was a high school athlete. You know, this is a guy who obviously likes sports. Um, he wasn't just some nerd who'd always sat on the sidelines or whatever. So when he gets back and he's in the wheelchair and he's watching the baseball game, he's not going to want to just sit there and watch. He's going to want to participate in as much as he can. And and what's the problem with that? In some ways, that's that's heroism, right? That's someone yeah. doing something that's really difficult for them because they still have a passion for it. And that's a surely a good thing. That's something to be venerated. That's something to be encouraged in people. But like you say, the, the, whoever was reviewing this script and writing these notes was just like, what? What is this? What is this crap? Yep. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I, I don't know whether that actually happened. I haven't read the book, but I can imagine it happened. And if it didn't happen to Ron, it happened to someone else. So what's the problem here? Why have you got to be, why is this guy going to be such an asshole? <laughs> a question I exactly. asked about trying so many guys to... I served with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's trying to find a way, you know, to get back to being himself. And if, you know, playing a sport and being physically active is something he wanted to do, then he was, yeah, like you said, he's going to find a way to do it. So, yeah, that should be celebrated, not like made fun of or dismissed offhand. Yeah, it's uh, reading through the post-its, it just reminded me about how much masculinity and often toxic masculinity is what rules the military. You know, it, it, yeah. um, that uh, e each of these points were just, just hit it hard on a very, a very, toxic notion that that if you if you serve you, you you see it every day um you know a twisting of what of what men are capable of and of what they value um but it does it does it, it rules the day you know is that the 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 biggest strongest guy is 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 seen as the coolest the weak guys no matter what for what reason they're weak whether they're you know like people like ron or even people that have temporary injuries you broke your leg doing some kind of training and the guys give you shit for it until the moment your cast comes off because that's just the easy, that's just the low hanging fruit. Um, mm. But, but the, but the culture of the military is very much wrapped around that idea. Well, and, and the, I guess the, the pop culture of the military is very much wrapped around that idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the notion of, um, of showing that kind of vulnerability in a military veteran is something that didn't really happen in American cinema prior to the Vietnam War. Um, and even, yeah. after, even after the Vietnam War, we're only talking about maybe a few, you know, two, three dozen movies that actually explored this kind of territory at all. Um, and, and, you know, it's great that we have those films. It's great that we have those stories. It's great that people now have some degree of recognition of that fact. Um, but nonetheless, it wasn't like a, the lights suddenly went on in, in Hollywood that, oh, actually, we've been kind of mistelling the story of war for our entire <laughs> history. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the, and this film does it as well as any that I can think of, um, and certainly does it in a way that's very touching and powerful and very human and humane. Um, and like you say about that, that sort of that toxic form of masculinity, I mean, in some ways, there should there should be a movie called Toxic Masculinity, which sends up that whole notion of that's what it is to be a man, that that's what it is to be male, because it it doesn't serve. I mean, it doesn't serve men. It doesn't serve women. It doesn't really serve anyone except those who want to brutalize and dominate and uh, extend their power and manifest their power around the world. It doesn't really suit the, the actual guys on the ground. Like you say, it's kind of, you know, if you break your leg in training and you're getting shit about it for weeks, that's, that's not a very pleasant thing to go through. I mean, it's not the worst, th worst thing to go through, but it's sort of, that's not really a behavior that should be encouraged and certainly not something that should be sort of respected and, and glamorized in the way that so many war movies do. And certainly when you read through the file on how they tried to mess with this film, 
that comes through so clearly, that lack of sympathy, that lack of empathy, that lack of being able to see men and veterans, military veterans especially, as something other than the stereotype. When, of course, all of these people are human. They're, they're as diverse and different as humans anywhere else in the world. So telling a few of those other stories and at least opening the door to being able to empathize with someone who doesn't conform to that stereotype of masculinity is a powerful and important thing for a film to do. And I think that's partly why the film resonated so much with people is because they just hadn't seen very much of this before. That a lot of people probably deep down knew that this image of the great American fighting man isn't a very accurate or sort of representative image of very many of the people actually doing the fighting. Um, and so to now make it sayable and make it recognizable, I think is, is important and a, a brave and good thing for a filmmaker to do. Also with the choice of their lead, you know, like you have, here's Tom Cruise, which like, you know, he blew up with Top Gun and, and everybody was like, Oh man, like, you know, so he, he became this like masculine, like dominating figure and then like portrayed as such. And then, he goes, and then he's in this movie, and you like people probably were expecting him to be in that same role, and then he's totally not. He's like the complete opposite, and and I just I love that so much that they they that they chose him and that he accepted the role. Mm. Well, sure. I mean, Oliver Stone I think was initially a bit skeptical about Tom Cruise because he felt, you know, he looked at Top Gun, and I think. Oliver Stone once described Top Gun as a fascist movie, which is perhaps <laughs> yeah. a, a, a bit of an exaggeration, but it's certainly, you know, it is a very, very pro-militaristic movie. Um, yeah. But and I think what he, he then realised was actually, no, it, he is in some ways the perfect person to play this role because people won't be expecting it. People will be expecting the, you know, the pretty boy Tom Cruise, the glamorous Tom Cruise that people like and fancy and, you know, want to sleep with, whatever. Um, and what they actually ended up with was this, you know, guy with he, he sort of, he's got the mullet hair and the ratty little moustache. And he doesn't even really look like Tom Cruise for most of the film. He doesn't have that, you know, sexiness and what have you that, that it makes Tom Cruise appealing to a lot of people. Um, and so he took, I think in his words, you know, this young guy who seemed to have it all, and turned him into a story of a man who lost it all. And that's, that's powerful stuff, because, again, people just aren't expecting it. And I would have been very interested to see what this film would have been like if Al Pacino had played that role instead of Tom Cruise. I have a feeling it, Al Pacino might have got a bit carried away, because he usually does get a bit <laughs> carried away. <laughs> um, so it would have been quite a different movie. But nonetheless, I think, you know, Tom Cruise was at that point in time as good a casting decision as they possibly could have made. And to be honest, most of the rest of the cast are really good. Um, I think the, the Willem Dafoe character, I've, I mean, oh, I, always, yeah. I always like Willem Dafoe as an actor and obviously Platoon, that's probably how he ended up in this film was his connection from there. Um, but he doesn't play a huge role. He doesn't have a, you know, a lot of lines or anything in this film, but he plays a, a critical role in the story. And he's in some ways a counterpoint, a, um, a sort of mirror image of Ron and makes Ron realize that he's kind of on the wrong track here, that if he carries on down this road, he's going to end up like that guy and he doesn't want to be that guy. So that's sort of where he starts to find the strength within himself to be someone different and to not let his suffering overcome him. And again, powerful stuff and stuff that I know a lot of people can't necessarily relate to the being paralyzed and being in a wheelchair, but we can all relate to suffering. So, right. yeah. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism, 
is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. You good people And listen to my song I hope you'll pay attention I will not detain